Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome. I'm Pamela Forward, President and Ex Executive Director of Whistleblowing Canada Research Society. And uh, for those of you who don't know about our work, uh, we're uh, a nonprofit registered charity in Canada, and our purpose is to um, advance education on the whistleblowing phenomena uh, in order to inform public policy, uh, dialogue, and, and development. Um, and so um, I'm here in Ottawa, in Ontario, and uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, that we are on the um, traditional territory of the uh, Anishinaabe Algonquin peoples. Uh, and I'd also like to especially welcome our guests from uh, South Africa. Uh, we have many uh, attendees, including our speakers today. So uh, a special welcome to you all. Um, so today um, I will be your moderator and uh, Dr. Rago will be uh, managing things in the background. Uh, so we shall um, proceed. Um, we'll do introductions and then our speakers uh, will each speak for 20 minutes. And that should take us to uh, about uh, quarter to one our time. Uh, so that'll leave us some time for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, if, if there, uh, there is a, usually a little flexibility for uh, some, um, excuse me, some, uh, a little extra time, five or 10 minutes, if there are uh, people still wanting to answer questions. So um, having said all of that, um, uh, I think we can move on to our speakers. Um, the first speaker today is uh, Dr. Tina Us, um, and she is a professor of sociology at the University of Joseph Johannesburg in South Africa. And she's held the position of head of department for 15 years and is a certified clinical sociologist with the Association for Applied and Clinical Sociology. She was recently appointed to the United Nations Independent System-Wide Evaluation Mechanism a Global Panel of Advisors. She also served as a Fulbright Visiting Scholar at George Washington University and the University of Cincinnati in 2013. Professor Oos has held numerous leadership positions in the sociology community, including Vice President, the National Associations uh, of the International Sociological Association, uh, past president of uh, the ISA's clinical sociology and social psychology divisions, and former president of the South African Sociological Association. Additionally, she serves on the advisory board of Whistleblowing Canada Research Society. Um, she is co-editor of Clinical Sociology Review, a journal that publishes articles in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, she has authored or edited over 60 publications. Her most recent books are Clinical Sociology for Southern Africa, uh, co-edited with Jan Marie Fritz and Whistleblowing and the Sociological Imagination, published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2022. Professor Is is rated as an internationally recognized researcher by the South African National Research Foundation and specializes in clinical sociology with a specific focus on advancing the sociological understanding of whistleblowing. So um, with that introduction, Tina, I'm going to turn proceedings over to you. Um, um, Pamela, could I just ask you to introduce uh, Ugi as well, Uglesha as oh, well, right. because we're going to swap. 
All right, has, so yeah. I'll do that now as well. All right, then our special, our second speaker um, is Uglesa Radu, Radulovic, um, and he was awarded his PhD in industrial psychology, having completed a thesis titled State Capture, Civil Society Organizations, and Whistleblowing Under the Zuma Presidency. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Johannesburg's Department of Sociology. Uglhesa is presently focusing his research on South Africa's legislative instruments for the protection of whistleblowers and support structures for whistleblowers um, in the absence of adequate statutory protection. He has lectured on an undergraduate level at uh, the University of Johannesburg's Department of Sociology, uh, Faculty of Humanities, and is actively lecturing on postgraduate levels at UJ's Department of Sociology and the School of Public Management and Governance, College of Business and Economics. Um, so uh, Paloma, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tina will be our first speaker, uh, followed by Uglesa. Corruption is not a new phenomenon in South Africa. It was abandoned throughout the apartheid regime. Allegations of corruption were also rife in the new South Africa long before the start of the Zuma presidency. Whistleblowers assisted by the media and civil society organizations played a prominent role in exposing uh, corruption in state organs in South Africa. Their disclosures and the retaliation they experienced and still experience have highlighted the necessity of protecting and supporting whistleblowers. As the allegations of whistleblowers emerged, it became evident that rather than mere corruption, the actions involved what we now refer to as state capture. In contrast to corruption, where individuals opportunistically abuse their positions of power for personal gain, State capture refers to repeated and well-organized collusion practices where state officials extract personal benefits by giving control of state resources to agents external to the state. In 2016, the, pub, the then public protector, Tuli Madonsela, published the State of Capture report, which collated testimonies from several whistleblowers, such as Musilu Mutepu and Bianca Goodson from Trillium. This set the ball rolling for the appointment of the Zonda Commission of Inquiry into state capture in January 2018. On 14 February 2018, Jacob Zuma resigned as president of South Africa, uh, probably not willingly. The full Zonda Commission report was handed to President Ramaphosa on 22 June 2022. This slide provides a few examples of whistleblowers exposing government corruption long before the stern state capture entered the public domain in South Africa. And these are just a few examples of the many who disclosed various forms of government corruption. Uh, the first is Mike Chichonga. He was working in the Department of Justice and he exposed nepotism uh, where the Minister of Justice awarded a liquidator lucrative state contracts. Um, there was also rampant corruption in prisons where Tatolu Setlai uh, 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 provided evidence of warders involved in all sorts of um, unacceptable uh, behaviors. There was the so-called Travelgate scandal where members of parliament abused the uh, um, travel voucher privileges, and this was exposed by Harry Charlton, another whistleblower. And then there was the uh, arms scandal, where Patricia Delo uh, shed light on how politicians, together with private actors, perpetrated large-scale corruption under the uh, uh, blanket of a major defense procurement program. And President, former President Zuma, was also um, 
seen as being involved in this process. Just over six months after the release of the Public Protectors Report, Amabungani and the Daily Maverick, two South African investigative news outlets, published the Gupta Leaks exposures, which was arguably the single most important event in bringing state capture in South Africa to the fore. These media outlets received hard drives belonging to Sahara, a Gupta company, from two whistleblowers. The hard drives contained 300,000 emails showing that the Gupta family played a central role in manipulating the awarding of government contracts. In fear for their lives, Stan and John, as they were called, were relocated abroad while still remaining anonymous. The Gupta leaks opened a Pandora's box and exposes, exposures by numerous other whistleblowers followed. Simpiwa Maicela at the PIC, Cynthia Stimple at SIA, Arthur Sardi at Ecobank, Suzanne Daniels at ESCOM, Destina Derry, Farm Whistleblowers, Ang Angelo Agristi at Busasa, and many more. So uh, this is where we begin detailing prominent South African state capture whistleblowers. The first case, uh, that we would like to draw your attention to is the case of betting against the state. And this is where the whistleblower, Masilo Motepu, uh, disclosed that Gupta linked Trillion had prior knowledge regarding cabinet reshuffles. Trillion, a private firm, would use these reshuffles to establish a business advantage. Conveniently, on the board of directors at Trillion was Salim Essa, colloquially uh, referred to as the fourth Gupta brother. Um, so they had very clear links to the state and to involvement in the state. But it wasn't only this uh, prior knowledge of cabinet reshuffles. Trillium was also invoicing the state for work that they had not done. Masilo, having brought this to the fore, faced bogus charges, which she spent a lot of time and money defending. Um, she then wa was struggling to find alternative means of employment post her disclosure and lives in fear for her life. Another trillion whistleblower came to her help, Bianca Goodson, sometime after her disclosure, and she substantiated Musilo's claims. Bianca, as a consequence of her disclosure, is now unemployed, divorced, and suffering from depression. Another very important case that we would like to draw your attention to is that of the capture of the Public Investment Corporation. The Public Investment, Public Investment Corporation, or the PRC, is a state on enterprise that uh, manages public pensions. They're supposed to trade these public pensions uh, against safe investments or safe returns rather. al uh working at EcoBank in West Africa, became knowledgeable about this. That is, public investment corporations' dubious 250 million US dollar investment into their bank, a bank that was on the rating agency's watch list for downgrade at the time. At the PRC Commission of Inquiry, he questioned this investment after having blown the whistle at EcoBank uh, and the financial malversations that were occurring at EcoBank. He faced legal action and he's lost his career. He's now struggling to motivate to his or explain to his wife and children why it is that they can no longer afford a holiday home and any other commodities. Uh, another prominent case is that of the hijacking of the national flag carrier, South African Airways. Cynthia Stimple blew the whistle on this. Uh, she became knowledgeable about a 256 million rand contract that South African Airways was to sign with a very suspect service provider, BMP Capital. When this began transpiring, she decided to, of her own accord, go out and uh, acquire a number of different quotes from more reputable banks or service providers. Each of these banks came in with significantly lower quotes for the delivery of the service. I believe that they were at about one third of the cost. She questioned this. She questioned the board of directors at SAA. Um, they told her that it was none of her business and she was not to meddle there. She then engaged in internal whistleblowing. She faced the ramifications for that and was suspended. As a byproduct, she went external and then public. She faced a massive backlash from South African Airways top management um, and had Hi, to defend this. Yeah. Yeah. 
But hey, that that guy is. In a labor forum. Sorry, I can hear someone else. Um, She had to defend herself in a labor forum. So apparently she needs to teach yoga as a means of survival. Although she has uh, ventured into new ventures uh, with, uh, we're going to discuss it soon, the whistleblower house. Other prominent cases of South African whistleblowers that point towards state capture is the first case that we would like to draw out is that of the capture of the National Prosecuting Authority. And we've we've deemed this as early onset state capture. Glynis Breitenbach, a prosecutor at the NPA, uh, blew the whistle on the destruction of the authority's capacity to function. Um, She uh, indicated that uh, Nongobo Jiba and Lawrence Arebi uh, were completely impacting on the authority's capacity to function by protecting uh, the Minister of uh, Crime Intelligence, Richard Mbruli. She was, as a consequence, sidelined and she faced three assassination attempts, two of which were direct shootings at her, and one was a, a case where she was uh, charged off the road. The destruction of the country's tax authority also occurred in South Africa. Ethel Williams came forward and implicated 39 individuals, as well as the company that he worked for, Bain & Co, in corrupt activities at SARS, South African Revenue Services. He had to flee South Africa in fear for his life. The Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa was also captured. Martha Ngoy blew the whistle on this. Uh, she pointed towards major corrupt projects within Prasa. She was sidelined, suspended, and faced a legal onslaught from her employer. Um, most recently, and we just discussed this uh, now as we as we led into this meeting, uh, the state's the the state's power utility has been completely disempowered. Andre De Reiter, arguably South Africa's most recent high-profile whistleblower, has exposed the destruction of ESCOM through the sabotage of its resources and the plundering of its resources. He had, as a consequence, uh, leading up to his disclosure, faced a cyanide poisoning assassination attempt, yet to flee South Africa in fear for his safety. And these whistleblowers that we spoke about faced severe detriments. Their lives have been irreversibly altered, undeniably. However, the worst outcome they somehow managed to avoid, as was the case with Glynis, uh, we've pulled out some South African whistleblowers that weren't lucky enough to have survived the assassination attempts. Jimmy Mukhlala was killed in 2009. He was gunned down at his home for exposing procurement corruption relating to the construction of a stadium for the FIFA World Cup that South Africa would host in 2010. This was in the city of Nelspreet. Mos Bakoy, also murdered in 2009. He was shot and killed after exposing corruption in a municipality in the northwest province. Zola Banisi, shot and killed in 2014 outside of his girlfriend's house after exposing double invoicing fraud at um, uh, Bloomwater. Moses Tsake and Philemon Gwenya were both murdered. Moses, Moses was kidnapped and tortured and died in hospital two months later. Philemon was murdered in his own home. Both of them detailed the fraudulent diversion of state funds to the Gupta-linked Estina Dairy Farm. A very prominent case on many people's, oh, on the South African public's lips, is that of Abita Diakaran. She was a public health official that was in the midst of a public procurement uh, of, of per- personal protective equipment uh, fraud relating to uh, public procurement fraud. Uh, and she was murdered in a rain of bullets after dropping a child off at school. I believe she was shot over 30 times after she dropped her child off at school. Father and son, Klutz and Thomas Murray were murdered now in March of 2023. They were liquidators, accountants, uh, expert accountants and liquidators for Gupta Businesses and Basasa, a company which is also involved uh, or was also involved in the capture of the state through fraudulent contracts with the Department of Correctional Services. So the dark truth of whistleblowing, uh, particularly in South Africa, is that these whistleblowers faced various forms of retaliation which frequently resulted in occupational detriments, social isolation, and less frequently, but alarmingly, a risk of being subjected to physical harm, resulting in death most commonly. Generally, they lost their jobs, and they had to find new career paths to survive financially. Almost all of them are now in financial, dire financial situations. I'm not saying all of them, but a large proportion of them are. 
Some of them have suffered severe psychological detriment, and they still suffer from the psychological detriment. In some cases, they've been completely deserted by friends and even family. Some have faced physical threats and sometimes even sacrificed their lives to bring their exposures to the fore. Uh, the whistleblowers shared a fundamental belief in doing the right thing, despite, despite the likelihood of facing severe retaliation. I'm waiting on Tina. Sorry, are you there, Prof? Are you waiting on Tina? Okay. Sorry, yes. I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> um, the South African Protected Disclosures Act number 26 of 2000 was seen as at the forefront of whistleblowing protection legislation when it was introduced. Unfortunately, it soon became clear that it was inadequate to protect whistleblowers against the abundant obstacles they faced even with the amendments that were introduced in 2017. Uh, the PDAA focuses on measures that prevent at, or at least discourage retaliation, thereby mitigating the whistleblower's private troubles. It also attempts uh, to uh, develop measures that encourage and facilitate disclosures of wrongdoing. These measures allow whistleblowers to act as organizational citizens through encouraging the reporting of bad news and enabling whistleblowers to speak truth to power. However, despite all these measures, the PDA ha has the glaring failure that it does not meet Transparency International's best practice guidelines for whistleblower legislation. According to Feinstein and Devine's 2021 evaluation of whistleblower protection legislation, South Africa only complies with five of the 20 best practices they identified. By the way, Canada only complies with one. So what are the inadequacies of the PDAA? When we listen to all these stories about South African state capture whistleblowers and the whistleblowers that went before them, uh, it uh, uh, is clear that the PDAA failed the state capture whistleblowers spectacularly. Even after the amendment, the legislative model is still mainly anti-retaliation and reactive rather than proactive. The PDAA gives a lot of attention to whether the whistleblower's actions comply with the requirements that qualify for protection against retaliation, or the making of a so-called protected disclosure. It therefore opens up the opportunity for organizations and or perpetrators to place the focus on the messenger, the whistleblower, while disregarding the message about the perceived wrongdoing. The most recent state capture whistleblower, former CEO of ESCOM, Andre Dereta, is a good example. Even before the television interview where he disclosed details about large-scale corruption and fraud at ESCOM, the Minister of Energy, Gwedi Mantashi, accused him of being a traitor. Public Enterprises Minister Praveen Gordon indicated that he does not view Dereta as a whistleblower, but that he is suffering from a messiah complex. The discussion in government circles seemed to center on where he found the time to write a book or the quality of the private investigation he launched into corruption at ESCOM, rather than trying to determine the nature and the extent of the wrongdoing. The PDAA includes a good faith requirement without clarifying what this entails. In addition, the PDAA makes it an offense to knowingly make a false disclosure. This allows for attacks on the credibility of whistleblowers and questioning their motives. Every state capture whistleblower has experienced attempts to discredit their message by portraying them as untruthful, grandstanding, out for vengeance, or involved in criminality themselves. How, how, what are the, all the weakness, particular weaknesses? And there are a lot I could spend hours talking about that. So I'm just going to identify a few of these uh, uh, weaknesses. In the first place, the protection provided by the PDAA is not wide enough. Um, 
there is no protection prior to the retaliation occurring. So it's only after whistleblowers have already suffered uh, retaliation that they can then rely on the PDAA. There's no protection against criminal and civil liability. Organizations typically respond by instituting disciplinary hearings or court cases against whistleblowers. And we've seen that with various, Musilu Mutepo, Bianca Goodson, uh, um, uh, Glynis Breitenbach, all of them went through this whole process. Uh, the PDAA follows the defense approach that allows whistleblowers to use a protected disclosure as a defense in criminal and legal, legal proceedings. However, that leaves the whistleblower to confront the unnerving prospect of having to defend their disclosures in a court of law, attended by the threat of high financial costs and reputational damage. That's not a very strong protection that they have in that case. The burden of proof regarding occupational misconduct, what, uh, how the act phrases uh, uh, retaliation as occupational misconduct, lies with the whistleblowers. Uh, whistleblowers find it challenging to prove that their employers had initiated disciplinary hearings or dismissed them as a direct result of blowing the whistle. There are no specific provisions relating to pr the protection of the identity of the whistleblowers or uh, treating what they, what they disclose in a confidential, confidential manner regarding their identity. At the Zonda Commission, Dudu Mieni, the former chair of the SAA board, repeatedly exposed the identity of an anonymous whistleblower, despite frequent admonitions to refrain from doing so and didn't suffer any consequences. There are no provisions to protect the personal safety as we've seen from the large list and there are many more that we could have added that lost their lives. Uh, and there are several examples of state capture whistleblowers who fled the country in fear of their lives. There are also no protection for those mistaken as whistleblowers or connected to whistleblowers. So called spillover retaliation. Furthermore, the legislation is also not a sufficient deterrent to prevent employers from victimizing whistleblowers. Um, the PDIA makes inadequate provision for penalties strong enough that they would dissuade employers from engaging in occupational detriment. The absence of punitive damages limits the potential financial loss that organizations uh, could be liable for. It's generally in their interest to drag out a case, hoping that a lack of financial resources and the resultant emotional strain would force the whistleblower to concede defeat. There's no personal accountability for retaliation and occupational detriment is not an offense in terms of the PDAA. In addition, the PDAA does not take sufficient account of the power imbalance between the whistleblower and the organization. For example, it does not ensure that whistleblowers receive financial support in the form of compensation for losses or pay, payment, uh, paying for their legal, um, providing legal assistance. The employer could also entangle the whistleblower in a prolonged media campaign, which means that the whistleblower has to do battle on multiple fronts. Okay, next slide. Um, then whistleblowers raise their concerns because they want these concerns to be investigated. And what is a problem with the PDIA is that the, it does not make provision for independent investigation of the whistleblower's claims. Uh, Whistleblowing, the whistleblowing mechanisms are only successful if there is a quick and thorough investigation of the disclosures and transparency in communicating the investigation's outcomes to all appropriate stakeholders. And the PDAA does include some measures that require that organizations and authorities implement processes to investigate the whistleblower's claim, claims and that if it is, if they are found valid to um, to take effective action to deal with the revealed misconduct. It also provides for keeping the whistleblowers in the loop about the progress of the investigation. Unfortunately, there is no uh, in enforcement mechanism to ensure that the organizations follow this requirement. And the PDAA does not require that this 
investigation should be independent from the organization, which means that it doesn't really provide much of a protection and does not ensure that the organizations will actually uh, investigate those claims. They would rather focus on dealing with the messenger. There are many ways in which legal protection for whistleblowers can be strengthened. We highlight a few of these. Uh, there should be preemptive protection from all forms of retaliation. Um, a waiver of liability should be implemented that prohibits bringing criminal or civil proceedings against someone who revealed uh, wrongdoing. Um, engaging in occupational detriment or retaliation should be an offence and there should be substantial penalties for those who retaliate against whistleblowers. It's also important that a reverse burden of proof should be implemented, which moves the responsibility to prove that the legal action is unrelated to the disclosure to the employer rather than to the whistleblower. Full compensation to cover all costs and losses should be provided to the whistleblower. Uh, the whistleblowers should be provided with uh, reliable identity and safety protection. There should be a requirement of independent investigation of whistleblowers dis disclosures. And ultimately, if all these uh, recommendations are implemented, it would go some way towards leveling the playing fields and uh, 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 balancing the power between the whistleblower and the um, and the organization, which at this moment is very uneven. So it's in light of these uh, glaring uh, legislative inadequacies that civil society had to in, uh, intercede and attempt to support whistleblowers where there was an absolute lack of protection. It was. Sorry, I can hear someone in the background. Um, so it was. It needs to go on was, mute because it makes it hard to hear the presenter. I'm sorry. Uh, so it was. Yeah, it was. It was in the face of these these uh, this inadequate legislative protection that civil society had to step in and offer support to whistleblowers. It happened in two ways, uh, such as in the case of Mosilo Motepu she went directly to the public protector. So the, the, here's the possibility that the whistleblowers can uh, uh, directly access uh, independent state institutions. In South Africa, it's chapter nine institution, the public protector. However, um, independent mass media and NGOs acted in the form of civil society to intercede between whistleblowers and uh, the public protector and place their information to the public domain and offer some support to whistleblowers. So what is civil society? <clears throat> civil society is a wide array of formal and informal associations that advance public interests and as a consequence advance democracy and ideas independently from the state, the public sector and the for-profit private sector. The first of which we would like to discuss is that of uh, the French NGO uh, PLAF, that's a French acronym, but in English it stands for the platform to protect whistleblowers in Africa. So they're active throughout Africa. And they were quite active in, in, in supporting South African state capture whistleblowers. Um, they paid for some of these whistleblowers legal expenses. Examples of that would have been them covering Osilo Motepu's legal bills, as well as Simpiro Maisela, the PRC whistleblowers legal expense. They also provided informal counseling, such as late night phone calls to certain whistleblowers as well as providing security advice, as well as tangible security support, such as upgrading uh, security systems, cameras and alarm systems for a certain whistleblower, um, as well as installing trelly doors, that is a type of uh, burglar-proof door in South Africa for uh, Mosilo. They engage in advocacy to gain the support of other C uh, civil society organizations and journalists, and they are trying to build a web of support for these whistleblowers. Outer, the organization I'm doing tax abuse, uh, has been active on the South African uh, uh, civil uh, citizenship scene for some time. They initially formed around an, uh, uh, an opposition to the urban tolling allowance, 
uh, and this was largely centered around very contested electron, electron, electronic gantry systems that were implemented in the province of Hateng. That's where you find uh, Johannesburg, the cities of Johannesburg and Pretoria. They eventually expanded their mandate and began assisting uh, whistleblowers that were exposing uh, tax abuse or state tax abuse. Um, in the case of Cynthia Stumble, they helped her to stop the SAA transfer of funds with an urgent interdict. Uh, they also provided a legal defense and continue to provide a legal defense for some whistleblowers at their own cost. Later, they employed some whistleblowers, uh, such as Bianca Goodson. They weren't able to employ her on a permanent basis as they could not afford her services on a permanent basis, but were able to give her some part-time employment. Corruption Watch uh, predates whistleblower support activity in South Africa, uh, pre predates uh, Art and Plof and their activity in South Africa, in that they, they drafted a very important manuscript for South Africa called the Whistleblower's Handbook. And what the Whistleblower's Handbook provides is an explanation for what whistleblowing entails and why it is important in advancing corrective action in the country. And they also presented a practical illustration of how one can blow the, uh, the whistle in South Africa and also warning whistleblowers that this is not something that, that they will likely not be thankful for, but something that they will rather face retaliation for. A description of all the South African legislative frameworks that protect a whistleblower, along with a list of useful contacts in the event of a disclosure can be found in this handbook. Corruption Watch continues to actively maintain a whistleblower archive on their website, which contains whistleblowing cases, developments, and advice for whistleblowers or prospective whistleblowers. The Whistleblower House. Uh, this is South Africa's uh, first whistleblower only civil society organization or NGO. And it's very new, very much in its infancy. It was launched on the 22nd of February of last year. Its founding members, interestingly, are Bianca Goodson, uh, whilst Cynthia Stimple and the former COO of Arta, Ben Theron, form part of their board of directors. Cynthia and Ben are very involved or are wholly involved in running the institution, along with the, uh, some academics and other prominent whistleblowers and uh, uh, active citizens. Uh, by October of 2022, just a few months into their existence, they already supported 91 whistleblowers. Um, I saw Cynthia was in the audience earlier. I don't know if she's here still, uh, but I'm very interested to see what those numbers are like now. I haven't managed to find any new statistics, but I presume it's grown exponentially. I'm um, going and the Daily Maverick. These are two independent media outlets. We felt it was very important to include them here. They were very involved as, as active civil society organizations. They were responsible for protecting the identities of Stan and John, as well as relocating them. They were pivotal in communicating several whistleblowers' messages to the broader public, not just Stan and John's. Both media outlets continue to serve the public good by presenting the whistleblowers' disclosures, or several whistleblowers' disclosures, and by advocating for whistleblowers. What they do is they work closely with NGOs in ensuring that whistleblowers receive support in the face of inadequate uh, legislative protection. Uh, interestingly, uh, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Maverick, I just want to go back to this, is that the editor-in-chief in chief of the Daily Maverick also faced an assassination attempt shortly after uh, supporting Stan and John. They cut the wheels of his uh, rather large vehicle. He, he drove a large SUV and he crashed. Uh, they were cut with what appears to be some sort of hard, uh, 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 large piece of hardware. The consequence of, of or, or, or examining these, these types of support that civil society offered, we were able to, to develop a support topology, which we feel is very relevant for South Africa, but is also translatable to other contexts. Uh, the first type of support that we identify here is that of offensive support or helping the whistleblowers in making the uh, exposure public, uh, which is anyway on the topology of the tiers of reporting, but this is a type of support. Uh, and this is accomplished through advocating for the whistleblower and getting the interests of the journalists in communicating the whistleblower's narratives. Uh, they also have to raise public support and create, but also create mitigating strategies. What uh, the Daily Maverick and Ama Bungane 
and News24, another independent media outlet that supported them in the Gupta leaks, what they did was they built a stock of stories uh, and they used the stock of stories in uh, as a backup in the event of uh, Stan and John's lives being put in danger. They would have released these stories um, and those stories would have then implicated the corrupt officials. Um, and I'm sure that uh, I presume that they would still use the same strategies. Some um, media outlets and civil society uh, NGOs mediated between whistleblowers and official commissions. I know that Mungane was one of them. They mediated between the Zondo Commission of Inquiry and Stan and John. Uh, another form of support that we identified is that of social support that served as coping mechanisms. Here we identified inclusive support, which would entail including the whistleblowers in meaningful activities, such as including Cynthia in the meaningful activity of, of, of stopping that interdict, uh, stopping that uh, uh, dubious deal at SAA. Emotional support, such as offering uh, whistleblowers the reassurance that what they did was correct and informally counseling through late night telephone calls, for example. Formal counseling uh, is a very sensitive and difficult matter for whistleblowers, particularly in South Africa. Why? As some of these whistleblowers wish to maintain their anonymity and confidentiality, it will be difficult to get a trained formal counselor who would then have access to their details. And um, this was the predicament that some civil society organizations were faced with in South Africa. Informational support, uh, is also key here as a form of social support. And an example here would be the whistleblower handbook as drafted by Corruption Watch. Instrumental support, these are tangible resources such as uh, money or a vehicle or a means of transport for the whistleblower. And then spiritual support deals with building the individual resilience of whistleblowers, addressing meaning, the meanings of their existence, uh, whether what they did was correct and should they have done it. Uh, it, can, it can emerge from not just from uh, uh, religious figures, but uh, from friends and family alike. Defensive support is protection or deals with protection. And this is uh, legal aid that's offered to the whistleblowers, uh, preferably, well, typically pro bono. Uh, financial support, financial aid, uh, security, as we detailed in the form of various security measures from uh, burglar proofing to cameras to alarm systems. Protecting the, protecting the whistleblower's identity, as was the case with Stan and John, and other whistleblowers that, that are still anonymous in South Africa, and then strengthening whistleblower's agency. So giving them a voice and uh, giving them a platform to present their narratives. And in doing so, what we've seen, the outcome has been Cynthia Stumple publishing um, her book, uh, uh, Hijackers on Board, Mosila Motepo publishing her book, um, Uncaptured, The True Account of the Nenegay Trillion Whistleblower, Glennis Breitenbach's book, Rule of Law, Interestingly, this is the final uh, model, and we were able to identify that, that defensive support is typically uh, required post-disclosure, after the whistleblower has made the disclosure. Social support is required during the disclosure phase, as the whistleblower is making the disclosure, and offensive support is, a re is required, uh, or the whistleblower requires it before having made the uh, disclosure. However, uh, you'll note that, that little illustration on the left there, we've uh, made provisions for potential to overlap. Depending on the feedback from both the wrongdoers and society at large, uh, social support might be required in the pre-disclosure phase along with offensive support. And the same can be said for offensive support, which might be required during the disclosure phase, again, depending on the feedback, but most commonly they occur per those phases. So our recommendations are that because support is limited, what is needed is to re reduce the, the fragmentation of support that civil society offers to South African whistleblowers. How do you do this? By civil society organizations coordinating the efforts, pooling their resources together, and, and uh, in, a, in a cumulative effort, supporting whistleblowers. There needs to be provisions for compensation for financial costs, and we had outlined this earlier. There needs to be provision for intangible costs. So intangible costs are those costs associated to uh, time lost with children or spouses or any family as a byproduct of uh, disclosure. Career rehabilitation. And this could come in the form of, oops, uh, career rehabilitation. This can come in the form of 
helping whistleblowers draft new CVs or reprogram their CVs for a new industry so they can enter the working world again because it, becomes very, it has become very difficult uh, for them to enter or to be even accepted. I mean, the case of Bianca Goodson was that she was uh, fired from her job after having made her disclosure a trillion, fired from a job at Sage, an accounting firm, because her previous disclosure might have badly reflected on, uh, on her new job or new company. Uh, also, whistleblowers should be given assistance in engaging with media, legal and political supporters. And to touch on media, they should be given training on engaging with both traditional forms of media as well as social media. They often don't use it adequately and it does a disservice to them. There needs to be a need to investigate uh, and address perceived wrongdoing. And this could be accomplished through use, uh, using previous whistleblowers and their experience in identifying prospective whistleblowers, respective cases of uh, fraud, corruption, or capture, and uh, building an early warning system to protect future whistleblowers. And this could be accomplished with the creation of a central complaints authority, a, a central agency such as a whistleblowing complaints authority. In South Africa, that would be a chapter nine institution, um, an independent state institution. But all of this would be in vain without a significant revision or redrafting of the very flawed whistleblower protection law in South Africa, which we believe uh, that there, that it should be occurring. Uh, there are taking reviews, but I don't know how that's standing. Uh, there's been nothing since the March review of law. Uh, and thank you for your time. This little tab at the top here, that little illustration at the top there is um, the back of uh, Daily Maverick's business card, Defend Truth, because whistleblowers bring truth to the fore. Uh, the, what Daily Maverick does is, and what we should do as civil society is defend whistleblowers. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, um, Boogie and Tina. Um, I'm speechless. Um, it sounded so much, so familiar, um, except for the open uh, shooting and killing of whistleblowers. Um, we don't openly do that, but we do harm them in, uh, in subtle ways behind the scenes and often uh, they do end up uh, unfortunately either they can't function properly for the future and some of them take their own lives. Uh, we heard that recently um, at a uh, parliamentary hearing uh, looking at whistleblowing laws. So thank you for this and uh, I have um, one question here, uh, but I'd like to, that person had to leave early and left the question. 